It used to fill his dreams, night after night. When he was little, it was a giant octopus that he'd seen in a cartoon movie. The octopus would come up on the beach and wrap its tentacles around him and squeeze him to death. He would wake up in the dark and think he was dead. Later, it was a huge, shadowy, faceless giant who was coming to kill him. He would wake up afraid and then slowly realize the giant wasn't real. He supposed everyone had dreams like that, although he doubted whether most people had them so often. He had come to think of dreams as dynamic perceptions of reality. They were suppressed and filtered out of consciousness by conventional patterns of static social and intellectual order, but they revealed a primary truth, a value truth. The static patterns of the dreams were false, but the underlying values that produced the patterns were true. In static reality, there is no octopus coming to squeeze us to death, no giant that is going to devour us and digest us and turn us into a part of its own body so that it can go stronger and stronger, or we are dissolved and lost into nothingness. But in dynamic reality? These manhole covers always fascinated him. Many intersections seemed to have nearly a dozen of them, some new and rough, others worn smooth and shiny, from so many tires rolling over them. How many tires did it take to wear a steel manhole cover smooth? He had seen drawings of how the manholes led down to staggeringly complex underground networks of systems that made this whole island happen. Electric power networks, telephone networks, water pipe networks, gas line networks, sewage networks, subway tunnels, TV cables, and who knows how many special purpose networks he had never heard of, like the nerves and arteries and muscle fibers of a giant organism, the giant of his dreams. It was spooky how it all worked with an intelligence of its own that was way beyond the intelligence of any person. He would never know how to fix one of those systems of wire and tubes down below the ground that ran it all. Yet, there was someone who did. And there was a system for finding that person if he was needed, and a system for finding that system that would find him. The cohesive force that held all these systems together, that was the giant. When he was young, feeders used to think about cows and pigs and chickens, and how they never knew that the nice farmer who provided food and shelter was doing so only that he could sell them to be killed and eaten. They would oink or cluck, and he would come with food, so they probably thought he was some sort of servant. He used to wonder if there was a higher farmer that did the same thing to people. Later he saw there was this giant. People look upon the social patterns of the giant in the same way cows and horses look upon a farmer, different from themselves, incomprehensible, but benevolent and appealing. Yet the social patterns of the city devours their lives for its own purposes, just as surely as farmers devour the flesh of farm animals. A higher organism is feeding upon a lower one and accomplishing more by doing so than the lower organism can accomplish alone. The metaphysics of substance makes it difficult to see the giant. It makes it customary to think of a city like New York as a work of man. But what man invented it? What group of men invented it? Who sat around and thought up how it should all go together? If man invented societies and cities, why are all societies and cities repressive of man? Why would man want to invent internally contradictory standards and arbitrary social institutions for the purpose of giving himself a bad time? This man who goes around inventing societies to repress himself seems real as long as you deal with him in the abstract, but he evaporates it as you get more specific. Sometimes people think there are some evil individual men somewhere who are exploiting them, some secret cabal of capitalists or 400, or Wall Street bankers, or WASPs, or name any minority group that gets together periodically and has secret conferences on how to exploit them personally. These men are supposed to be enemies of man. It gets confusing, but nobody seems to notice the confusion. A metaphysics of substance makes us think that all evolution stops with the highest evolved substance, the physical body of man. It makes us think that cities and societies and thought structures are all subordinate creations to this physical body of man. But it's as foolish to think of a city or a society as created by human bodies as it is to think of human bodies as a creation of the cells or to think of cells as created by protein and DNA molecules or to think of DNA as created by carbon and other inorganic atoms. If you follow that fallacy long enough, you come out with the conclusion that individual electrons contain the intelligence needed 
to build New York City all by themselves. Absurd. If it's possible to imagine two red blood cells sitting side by side asking, will there ever be a higher form of evolution than us, and looking around and seeing nothing and deciding there isn't, you can imagine the ridiculousness of two people walking down a street of Manhattan asking if there will ever be any form of evolution higher than man, meaning biological man. Biological man doesn't invent cities or societies any more than pigs and chickens invent the farmer that feeds them. The force of evolutionary creation isn't contained by substance. Substance is just one kind of static pattern left behind by the creative force. The city is another static pattern left behind by the creative force. It is composed of substance, but substance doesn't create it all by itself. Neither did a biological organism called man create it all by himself. The city is a higher pattern than either substance or a biological pattern called man. Just as biology exploits substance for its own purposes, so does this social pattern called a city exploit biology for its own purposes. Just as a farmer raises cows for the sole purpose of devouring them, this pattern grows living human beings for the sole purpose of devouring them. That is what the giant really does. It converts accumulated biological energy into forms that serve itself. When societies and cultures and cities are seen not as inventions of man, but as higher organisms than biological man, the phenomena of war and genocide and all the other forms of human exploitation become more intelligible. Mankind has never been interested in getting itself killed. But the superorganism, the giant, who is a pattern of values superimposed on top of biological human bodies, doesn't mind losing a few bodies to protect his greater interests. The giant began to materialize out of Fetus' dynamic dreams when he was in college. A professor of chemistry had mentioned at his fraternity that a large chemical firm was offering excellent jobs for graduates of the school, and almost every member of the fraternity thought it was wonderful news. World War II had just ended, and good jobs were all that anyone seemed to think of. The revolution of the 60s was still 20 years off. No one had thought of making the film The Graduate back then. Fetus had always believed science is a search for truth. A real scientist is not supposed to sell out that goal to corporations who are searching for mere profit. Or, if he had to sell out in order to live, it was nothing to be happy about. These fraternity brothers of his acted like they'd never heard of science as truth. Fetus had suddenly seen a tentacle of the giant reaching out, and he was the only one who could see it. So here was this giant, this nameless, faceless system reaching out for him, ready to devour him and digest him. It would use his energy to grow stronger and stronger throughout his life, while he grew older and weaker, until, when he was no longer of much use, it would excrete him and find another younger person, full of energy, to take his place and do the same thing all over again. Here up in the sky above him, right now, were the heads of the corporation, that had prompted the chemistry professor to make that talk to the fraternity so many years ago. This was the brain center of that corporate network, surrounded by other networks, financial networks, information networks, electronic transmission networks. That's what all those tiny bodies were doing up there, suspended so many hundreds of feet up in the sky, participating in the giant. 